Paul, philosophy came before science. And today, some scientists would say that philosophy has nothing to do with science, and the, the only purpose of, of good philosophy is to keep all the rest of philosophy away from science. <laughs> How do you see the relationship between science and philosophy? Well, it's an uneasy relationship, and you're quite right that philosophers have had something of a bad press in the scientific community. They're regarded as sort of meddlers and, okay. uh, and also as people who nitpick about minor points of detail or meaning and that uh, science is a sort of rough and ready enterprise in which we sort of charge ahead uh, based on a mixture of intuition and luck and mm. a whole lot of other things. And sure, the philosophers can come through afterwards and clean up the mess and maybe write the textbooks and present it to the public, uh, but that they have no business uh, at the cutting edge of science. So I, I think that's a bit unfair. You're quite right, historically, that most of the things that now occupy scientists were once part of philosophy. The nature of space and time is a good one. It's now part of the theory of relativity. Uh, the nature of matter, well, that's now particle physics, and so on. Uh, and the question is, is there still something in the realm of philosophy that they're preparing the ground for the next generation of scientists to look at? And there certainly are such things. For example, the mind-body problem, mm -hmm. the nature of mind, its relationship to matter, it's, it's a total mess in, in science. Of course, we've got the neuroscientists. They're doing heroic work in figuring out what's going on in the brain. But that's really not getting to the heart of the matter of the nature of consciousness. And philosophers have had 3,000 years to ponder that. And so that we have a sort of prepared position, or at least a shopping list of possibilities mm. uh, against which to, uh, to, to carry out our work in, in that area. Uh, I, I tend to get on very well with philosophers because I find them very useful people to talk to because they can often clarify my own arguments, even if I'm using them only as a sounding board. Uh, and, and so I, I think there is a place for philosophy and science. Many of my colleagues would disagree. They get quite angry about philosophers. Yeah, I, I think the, um, one of the critical areas is, is forcing a clarity of thinking a clarity of thinking about terms. We use lots of terms, uh, the, the argument of something from nothing, what is nothing, arguments about the nature of information, and to, to bring clarity to terms enables you to focus more clearly on, on specific areas. I'll give you a very good example of that, and I, I have derived great benefit from my early exposure to philosophers of the nature of time. And my scientific colleagues are awfully sloppy in the way they talk about time, because they continually talk about time flowing, uh, that uh, the passage of time and so on. Philosophers will tell you that these are meaningless concepts and they just muddle the thinking. And so people confuse the asymmetry of the world in time, often called the arrow of time, yeah. with the psychological impression of the flow of time, yeah. which we have, and it belongs to neuroscience, not to physics. And I've known some very distinguished physicists get totally muddled because they are conflating these two completely distinct concepts. The philosophers cleaned that up a hundred years ago. And this is a very good uh, area, the nature of time, because time is, is part of the problem in the conflict between general relativity and quantum mechanics, where in general relativity, uh, time is part of the space-time and a four-dimensional sort of uh, block universe, so-called. And in quantum mechanics, time is fundamental, and, and you, everything happens as processes through time. And, and that distinction I mean, it seems to be one of the critical distinctions in terms of the, the, uh, the, uh, 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 the ability to get a quantum theory of gravity. You're quite right, and, and the story of time is not yet finished. So there are aspects of time that we absolutely don't understand. It plays a very peculiar role in the quantum world. Uh, the, uh, everything else, like uh, position uh, in space and momentum and energy and so on, these correspond to certain mathematical objects in the theory. Time doesn't. It just gets plonked in there as a parameter, as we say. Uh, and so uh, then you start worrying about the nature of clocks and, uh, and how do you tell, how do you measure time in a quantum universe. And many of these things have not been resolved. It gets particularly bad when you try to apply quantum mechanics to the universe as a whole. Uh, because it looks like time just disappears completely from the description. So maybe it's a redundant concept, uh, or maybe 
as uh, which is what I favour, is that both space and time will turn out to be emergent concepts. Mm -hmm. That is, that the world at a more fundamental level will be built out of something else. We know not what, though there's plenty of speculative stuff out there, but that a world in which we have a well-defined space and time might be a rather special one, might be something that emerges from rather special initial conditions, and that it's something we just see on a daily level, but it's not truly fundamental. Another area that philosophers um, deal with in science is the nature of physical law. And some philosophers, uh, the radical empiricists, would say there is no law, there, there are not even regularities, there are just observations that you can do on a continuing basis, and, and we can never really get down very far. Um, wh what do you think of that? I'm pleased you've raised this subject because it's dear to my heart. So most of my colleagues who work in fundamental physics and cosmology think of the laws of physics as eternal, immutable, transcendent, perfect mathematical relationships. They're sort of out there in some platonic realm, and, and they're absolutely precise. If you say, well, maybe the laws are a bit sloppy, there's wiggle room. That's horror, shock yeah. horror, that they are perfect mathematical forms, because we can never test that. They want these laws to be transcendent because they want the laws to explain the coming into being of the universe. If you say, well, uh, the laws of physics came into being along with the universe but didn't somehow logically or in some temporal sense precede it, then the package of marvels, the laws and the universe, just popping into being for no reason looks very alarming. So there is this tendency among my colleagues to think of, of these laws as already existing, having, as, as a philosopher might say, uh, ontological status, that they, they are the bedrock of, of reality, these laws, and that the actual universe that is described by those laws is, uh, is contingent upon them. Uh, I, I've changed my point of view on that. I, you know, I think this um, dualism that was, goes back to Newton at least, of separating our description of the world into timeless immutable laws and changing contingent states of the world, it's, a, it's about time we abandon that dualism. So I'm exploring the idea that the laws and the states of the world could, could be coupled together. The, the laws are not immutable. They, some people say maybe the laws change with time. I think that's a bad way of looking at it. They could change with the state of the world. And so that opens up all sorts of new possibilities which we haven't explored yet.